Good morning. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Oh, wonderful. It's so great to see each and every one of you as we gather here to worship today. And a special warm welcome to those who are visiting with us. It's so wonderful to see you. A special welcome to family members, friends, guests. Thank you for joining us today on this Easter Sunday. I'm Pastor Brenda North. I use she, her pronouns. And on behalf of the whole congregation, I warmly welcome you as we gather together to celebrate the risen Christ on this Easter Sunday. As you came in today, each of you should have received a card that looks like this. Did you get one of these connection cards? I invite you to please fill this out. The ushers will be picking this up during our opening hymn. So uh, please, if you did not receive one of these, uh, at least one per family, uh, would you raise your hand and our ushers will make sure you have one? Oh, our ushers did such a good job. Did uh, every family get one? Do you need one? Oh, you got it. That's perfect. Excellent. Well, I heard a beautiful story I think that's so fitting for today. A uh, family was getting ready to come to church, and a little two-year-old girl had on her new Easter dress and her cute little Easter shoes with a bow on top, and she looked so adorable. But her father wondered, does she even know what Easter means? So he asked her, do you know what Easter means? And she said, yes. And he says, what does it mean? And she said, surprise! <laughs> you know, that's a pretty amazing understanding of Easter for a little two-year-old, isn't it? Because today, indeed, is a day of surprise. Surprise! Death is not the end of your story. Surprise! Love always wins. Surprise! God always has the last word. And no matter how bleak or troubling events may appear, we can trust in the surprise of Easter Sunday. And that's what we gather to celebrate today. So I invite you to open your hearts as Barbara leads us in the call to worship this morning. Yesterday, we thought death had won. Yesterday, we thought all was lost. Yesterday, we thought Christ was gone. But not today. Today we know that all has won. Today we know that hope is real. Today we know that Christ is here. We have a reason to hope. Alleluia. Alleluia. Please join us in singing Christ the Lord is risen today. And I
Please be seated. I cannot stay away on Easter morning. Like Peter, I would run if I could, stop the car, pump my arms, take the church steps two at a time, all to know, did it happen? Did it really happen? Is evil no match for love? I'd slide down the center aisle. I'd grab the mic to ask the angels, the heavens, the children. Were the stories true? And in response, the choir would sing, Alleluia. The children would flower the cross. The preacher would tell me the stone was rolled away. The people would pass the peace and welcome strangers and make room in the pews. And with faith over doubt, I would hope. For I imagine that all of that ordinary holiness would be enough for Peter, and it would be enough for me. Let us turn to God in this time of confession. Let us pray together. The stone is rolled away. We assume it is a mistake. The angels say, he is not here. The women tell the story. Peter runs to the tomb. Forgive us, God, for thinking an empty tomb is nothing more than a prank. Forgive us for seeing the charge burial false and still holding out still. Forgive us for pushing away reasons to hope when you are alive and well in this world. Unravel the threads of our unbelief. Amen. And now hear these words of forgiveness. The angels tell the women, remember what Jesus told you. So church, remember this. You are seen. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are held in God's grace. All of this is true. Grace and mercy abound for you. Remember this. Amen. We invite the choir to come forward at this time.
Thank you. That was amazing. I'd like to invite uh, the children to come forward and join me for a very special children's time. Boys and girls, could you come and sit in the front row here with me? Oh, wow. It's so nice to see you on this Easter Sunday. Well, you all got snazzed up today. I love your suit and I love your headband. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. So nice to see you. Happy Easter. Thank you. Well, we have some uh, one's very special coming uh, to help us with a uh, children's time today. Some of you may know Kay from leading our children's choir on Wednesday nights, and she has a wonderful lesson for us uh, to help us understand what Jesus did for us on Easter Sunday. Good morning, you guys. How are you? Oh, I'm sorry. You're just good. Are you good? What is today? Easter, yeah, and this is a day that we get to say, hallelujah, Jesus is risen, but I have a question for you. Do any of you guys know why we really celebrate Easter? Why? Why, Vega? You're right, it is, and it's a miracle that that happened, but I have another question for you. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Anybody know? Has anybody ever heard of a word called sin? You, you know that? What do you think sin is? Bad, turning away from God, right, and a bad thought and stuff. Well, you know what? That's really good. People, when we're born, do we have any sin in our body? Have we, have we done any bad things? We haven't, have we? But... As we get a little bit older, hang on one second, I gotta pull out my stuff here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Here's some sin, maybe right now. <laughs> Can I hold that for you? Yeah, would you? That'd be great. Thank you. I knew I was here for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of reasons you're here, Brenda, because I can't do that up there. <laughs> All right, so boys and girls. I have some cups here. I have people, I have Jesus, and I have sin. Ooh. See that sad face on it? So I'm going to tell you, when I was a little girl, I have a big brother, and um, he's about four years older than me, and when I was little, you know what I would do sometimes? What? I would hit him. And then I'd feel really bad, so I would cry, but my mom and dad would see me crying and think that he had done something wrong, and he would get <gasps> So, what happened? My heart started off really clean, but then I did that bad stuff. And then, as I got a little bit older, you know what else I did? What? I told some lies. Oh, like, no. one time, my mom and dad said, did you go to piano lessons? How was it? I said, it was great. They had called my piano teacher and knew I hadn't gone. <laughs> Guess what? That was some more sin. And then when I got older, I had kids. And sometimes I didn't have a lot of patience with my kids. And you know what? I love my kids. That wasn't very good. And sometimes I might say something that wasn't very nice to somebody. Uh-oh. Now I have all this sin in my heart. And it's not making me feel very good. And I was like, oh. What can I do to get rid of this? I, I don't know what to do. Do you guys have any ideas of how I could get rid of the sin in my body, in my heart? Hmm. Oh, I 
morning, Jesus. Is that what you were going to say too? <gasps> Pray for forgiveness? You mean, even though I told all those other people I might be, I was sorry? Who else did I need to tell I was sorry? Did I need to tell God? Well, guess what? When I do that, Jesus says, you are forgiven. And guess what? All that sin that was in my body is gone and in my heart, and my heart is clean again. So any time that you do something that you think maybe isn't going to make God happy or makes you feel yucky inside, if, you, if it makes you feel yucky inside, you know that God's not happy with that either. So that you can say, sorry to the person that you might have hurt, but if you say you're sorry to God, he says, I forgive and I love you. Whoops, I forgive you and I love you. And so you don't have to be afraid of sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so we could say we're sorry. And he says, I gotcha, you're good. All right. Thank you so much, Kay. That was lovely. Can we say a prayer together right now? Let's, uh, congregation, will you join the children in repeating after me? Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Help us to remember that when we sin, we can ask you for forgiveness. And you will make us clean again and help us to start over and to do better so we can love like you love. Amen. Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats. Projects there. So whichever you prefer. Yes, thank you. The scripture reading this morning is from the 24th chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's me, Simon Peter, the rock Jesus called me. Well, for a rock, I sure spent a lot of my time wandering off course. I guess you could say I have a wandering heart. I don't mean to have a wandering heart. No. My intentions are always good. I was blessed and honored to be called a disciple. And being part of Jesus' inner circle, well, that was the best. 
In fact, the last three years have been the best years of my life, the best imaginable. We were always close, Jesus and I. I felt he was my best friend. Of course, he, he loved all of us. But, and John, he understood him the best, but I was always right there by his side, ready and willing to do whatever he asked of me. I, I guess that's why it hurts so bad that, that I let him down. But I'm getting ahead of my story. You probably don't know all the things that happened this past few weeks. So let me back up a bit. As I have said, I've been Jesus' disciple for almost three years now. I will never forget the day I was called and that miraculous catch of fish. We, never, we nearly tipped the boat over. And I will never forget following Jesus from place to place, watching his miraculous healing and listening to his teaching. And there came a time when he sent us out, two by two, to teach and to heal by ourselves. It was as he always, but I think as, always, as he always said, that he would not always be with us. So we had to go out by ourselves and learn how to do these things on our own. They were great times. Great times. And somehow we thought these times would never end. We should have known better. Jesus told us that we would be given into the hands of his enemies. That he would be given in the hands of his enemies and he would be killed. Well, I couldn't believe it. In fact, I told him so. She, heaven forbid, Lord. This should never happen to you. But he was pretty tough on me for saying that. He compared me to Satan for, for tempting, him, tempting him away from this ordeal he felt he had to go through. I couldn't wrap my head around it. I still don't. But it was the lowest I'd ever felt. Well, until three days ago. But I'm getting ahead of my story. Jesus was determined to go into Jerusalem. I guess we all knew it was going to be dangerous. But Jesus' face was set. He had to go in. And we didn't even try to talk him out of it anymore. I guess things really started heating up for us when Jesus rose, raised our friend Lazarus from the dead. From the dead. You can't keep that a secret. No. And Jesus didn't help things. He wouldn't keep his mouth shut. He challenged them to their faces. You could just tell that trouble was brewing. Well, you should have seen the crowds in Jerusalem as he entered the gates on the, on the colt of a donkey, just as the prophet said he would. And the leaders of the people really, and then you saw the people, the people went wild, wild. Save us, they said. Hosanna, they cried. Praise to heaven and glory to God in the highest. It was magnificent. I couldn't believe it. But you can bet that rubbed the Pharisees the wrong way. They told Jesus to tell the crowd to be quiet. You know what Jesus said? I tell you that if these people stay quiet, the very stones will cry out. Not much they could say after that. When we had supper, that last supper with Jesus in the upper room, we all swore that we would never leave him. I knew in my heart that I would follow him to the death. We all said so. But Jesus knew our wandering hearts. He knew who would betray him. And he said, I would deny him. He looked me right in the face. 
seeing right into my soul and said, tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Of course, I said I wouldn't. I couldn't believe that I would. But then, when we went to the garden, to Jesus' favorite praying spot, we couldn't stay up with him and watch. I felt bad. I couldn't watch with him even one hour. But that was nothing compared to what was going to come next. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we were surrounded by soldiers, more soldiers than I'd ever seen in one place. And a crowd of people with torches. And Jesus coming up to my, my Lord and kissing him as a sign to his enemies of who this was. I panicked. I grabbed my sword. Although what I thought my sword against all so many enemies was going to do, I can't tell you. I panicked. I swung wildly. I, I know I hurt someone. But Jesus told me to put my sword away. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. I'm ashamed to say that we ran as far and as fast as we could. When I caught my breath, I thought I could follow from a distance, you know. Crept up close so I could keep an eye on what Jesus was doing, what was happening to him. It was a chilly night, and, and that, that bonfire in the courtyard was, looked so inviting. I should have known better. There was that servant girl with those sharp, shrewd eyes. I could tell she thought she knew something. Sure enough, she said, this man also was with him. I said, I, I didn't know him. Another man said I was Jesus, one of Jesus' followers. Again, I denied it. And it wasn't that much longer that another man said that surely I was with Jesus because he could tell by my speech I was a Galilean. I might have been yelling at this point. I, I, I don't know. But I do know that the moment I told him I didn't know what he was talking about, the rooster crowed. The rooster crowed. The rooster crowed, and I, I ran. I cried. I'm not ashamed to say it. I cried as if my heart was breaking. Because it was. Bursting from sorrow and shame at my denial. They crucified him the next day. And I thought, again, I, I could follow from a distance. And then next, a, a good man, Joseph of Arimathea, asked for Jesus' body and put it in his own brand new tomb. By that time, the sun had set and the Sabbath had begun, and so we rested hid, really, keeping well out of sight. But then this morning, the women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and a few others, got spices and went to anoint the body of our Lord in his tomb. I didn't go, neither John or James or any of the others. But pretty soon the women came running back with this amazing story. They said the stone had been rolled away, that they couldn't find Jesus' body. And then appeared to them two men in dazzling robes who said Jesus was not there, that he had risen just as he said he would. Well, the other men didn't believe the women's story. But I guess I had to see for myself, you know. So I ran to the tomb as fast as I could with John right by my side. John was faster, got there first. Stopped at the door and looked in. I ran right into the tomb. We both saw the linen cloths lying there. And no sign of Jesus' body. Amazing. Can it be? Will I see Jesus again? 
Will I be forgiven? Be still, my wandering heart. Thank you, Carl. Let us pray together. Oh God, we thank you for the witness of Peter, Mary Magdalene, John, and the other disciples. Lord, help us to live in gladness and the grace of Easter Sunday every day. Help us to walk in your mighty grace and tell your good news to the world. Amen. It's hard to believe that just over a year ago, I preached my sermon, uh, my first sermon for over uh, three years. I had been on a three-year-long medical leave, and it was one of the darkest times of my life. I know some of you have had similar experiences too, right? The months and months of waiting for doctors to figure out was what was wrong. The trial of different treatments, many of which didn't work and left me more ill than I was to begin with watching the look in the faces of my loved ones as they grow, grew more and more weary and more and more tired as the illness continued to progress. And then finally, the faint and slow joy and hope when finally the right treatment at the right time over enough period of time started giving me my life back. I was invited to preach at a tiny church up in northwest uh, Minnesota, and uh, with a hope that was greater than my fear, I agreed. I could barely dare to dream. Would I get my life back? Would I be able once again to do the things I love? Could I finally once again do some good in this world? So I went, and I uh, preached uh, for that tiny little sweet congregation. And it wasn't perfect, and I was tired, but somehow in the midst of that little congregation, I heard the whisper of God saying, yes, yes. And so with that tiny whisper in my heart, I dared to accept an interview that turned out to be with Glendale Church that allows me to be here today. And it was the beginning of a lot of wonderful and new changes. Uh, I had my first vacation in over three years. Uh, we moved here to Savage much closer to uh, some of our family and friends and our dear loved ones. Over time, I went from the goal of walking around my 1,400 square foot house a couple of days to walking around the cul-de-sac to walking around the neighborhood. And I realized I was living a resurrection. And at the same time, I was realizing, even as I'm living it, it's hard to trust in resurrection. It's hard to believe. And I've discovered the secret is to do what Peter does in our gospel lesson today. Peter runs toward hope. And I think that's what all of us need to remember to do this Easter season. How do we run towards hope? You know, the disciples had experienced uh, the most darkness and despair that we can even imagine. They understood that something very unique and special was happening in the life of Jesus. They understood, they just were beginning to understand that Jesus, in fact, was the embodiment of God on earth. That indeed, Jesus was the Messiah who had been long expected. And yet, what happened to him it was unimaginable, devastating for him to be crucified, for him to die. It was like the end of the world. So deep in grief, deep in confusion, deep in fear, 
And for some, like Peter, the disciples also were deep in shame, feeling they hadn't done enough, that they had gotten it all wrong. And yet, in this time of greatest despair, in this time of greatest difficulty, God broke through. So we have that wonderful Easter story about the women going to the tomb with their spices. And let me tell you, my friends, no one expected what was going to happen next. Even though Jesus had tried to prepare them, even though there is a message of resurrection throughout the Old and New Testament, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, as well as in the traditions of the time, even though it had been prophesied, they still did not expect it. And so when the women went to the tomb and saw that it was empty, they were deeply confused. Until the angels appear and ask them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is risen. And with once again hope slowly building into their, in their hearts, they ran back to the disciples to tell them what they had heard and what they had learned. Now remember, these women had been with Jesus and the disciples from the very beginning. These were the women who provided for the disciples and Jesus materially and financially the whole time. How do you think a group of men manages to travel across the known world and preach and share the gospel and keep themselves fed and clothed? You know it took a group of women. Can I get an amen? These were women they knew and trusted. These were women, many of whom were part of the family of the disciples. And yet when they come and they tell this incredible news about what the angel said and how the tomb was empty, do you hear what the disciples said? They said, oh, that's nonsense. In fact, the Greek word here is kind of like they are saying, that's garbage. You're talking trash now is what they say they didn't expect it they couldn't believe it and i share this because don't we sometimes discount the resurrection in the same way it would be so easy to dismiss the story of the resurrection as mere nonsense as garbage as scientifically impossible and therefore trash. The disciples initially thought so, until one by one, each of them had an experience of their own that they could not deny. An experience that caused them to reject their initial skepticism and know and believe that indeed Jesus is risen. And it starts with the action of Peter. Peter ran towards hope when he ran to that tomb. Peter ran towards hope. He had every reason to think it was nonsense. And yet, Peter ran towards hope. And when he was there, he discovered, too, the truth that Jesus is alive. Next week, you'll hear from Pastor Barbara a wonderful story about another group of disciples who experienced this themselves for the first time, too. And in two weeks, we'll revisit Peter's story and hear more about it. But what I want you to remember today, my friends, is I'm asking you, please, to run towards hope. As Magri de Vega wrote in his book, Embracing the Uncertain, if you are struggling in your prayer life, if you're struggling with doubts about prayer's nature and whether it works at all, run towards hope. Pray and keep praying until you can believe it. If you have a strained relationship with the Bible, wrestling over its words, and even struggling to read it at all, then, my friends, would you please run towards hope. Read the Bible. Keep believing. Ask for help. 
Wait and see if as you run towards hope and keep at it, if the Holy Spirit will guide you until you can understand and believe. Or let's talk some truth here today. Maybe you have a bittersweet relationship with the church. Maybe you've been betrayed by the Christian community in the past. Maybe you're reluctant to attend and participate. My friends, I ask you, will you please run towards hope? Run towards hope until you can find the community of God as it is intended, not perfect, but full of love and grace and acceptance. And I promise you, my friends, especially here at Glendale Church, you can find that authentic love and care. And we run, my friends, not only for ourselves, but can we run towards hope for our community? We know our school systems are struggling. We have a flood of migrants, many of whom are refugees. We have families who are struggling to meet ends meet, and children are not getting the help and attention they need at home. So can we run towards hope And can you be part of our volunteer project at Hidden Valley Elementary? We know people of all ages in our own community are going hungry. They're struggling simply to get food on the table. This is true of senior citizens who live alone and of families with young children where food is scarce. Can we, church, run towards hope and continue to help collecting food like we are right now for the CAP agency to help families in Scott County? Can we run towards hope and keep up our partnership with the open door food distribution? In other words, my friends, if you doubt the resurrection, then run towards hope. Start practicing resurrection life, living a life that counts so that you can believe for yourself. So like the disciples, you can turn from confusion and despair and doubt to awe and wonder and new life. May it be so. Amen. Let us stand and say together our affirmation of faith. We may weep through the longest nights. We may stare at the empty tomb with more questions than answers. We may run our fingers over the burial cloths and still long for more. But today we are people of hope. We believe in new beginnings. We believe that God created a world stronger than death. We believe that Jesus abides among us healing, teaching, and leaving fingerprints throughout this world. We believe that a tomb could not hold him. We believe that the sun does rise. We believe that Peter was there with questions, awe, and faith the size of a mustard seed. We believe that the story is not over yet, for God is among us, and today we are a people I invite us to sing together the hymn, Christ is Risen, and as uh, we sing, the ushers will bring forward our prayer requests and offerings.
asked if we could uh, find some hand sanitizer for our communion servers. That would be appreciated. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we come to this time of Holy Communion, and I invite you, if you're a guest here, you are welcome at this table. If you uh, seek to follow God in your life, this table is a place for you. So please come and receive. This gift of bread and wine is an opportunity for us to grow in our hope, to grow in our faith. This is the time as we come to the table to remember indeed what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so in just a few moments, the ushers will help you come row by row down the center aisle to receive the gift of bread and juice. You can deposit your empty cups in the receptacles uh, located near each aisle and return to your seat by the outside aisle. I'd like to invite those who are helping to serve communion today to come forward at this time. Thank you. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, giving thanks to God, and he told his disciples, take, eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when the meal was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so indeed, remembering these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we come to this table to receive these gifts. And we trust that in so doing, God grows in us. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here on, and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ given for this world. Amen. The body of Christ, broken, so that we who are many may be one. And the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Come and receive. Thanks be to God. the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Amber. And this is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Lisa. The body of Christ broken for you, John. Oh, let's try that again. <laughs> Thank you. The body of Christ broken for you, Penny. This is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Senna. The body, oh. <laughs> the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Scott. Thank you, Jen. This is the body of Christ broken for you, Jennifer. The body of Christ broken for you, Nick. The body of Christ broken for you, Diane. The body of Christ broken for you, John. Lois, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Don, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Oh yes, thank you. 
the body of Christ broken for you and the body of Christ broken for you, Leslie. The body of Christ broken for you. Ellie, this is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Mike. Carolyn, the body of Christ broken for you. We would be happy to bring it to you also, you know. <laughs> the body of Christ broken for you, Nancy. The body of Christ broken for you, Leona. The body of Christ broken for you, Beverly. The body of Christ broken for you, Barb. The body of Christ broken for you, Ken. The body of Christ broken for you, Paul. The body of Christ broken for you, Ginny. Beverly, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Oh, so good to see you. The body of Christ broken for you. Garrett, the body of Christ broken for you. Susan, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Linda, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Thaddeus, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Linda, this is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Mike. Rich, this is the body of Christ broken for you. body of Christ broken for you, Lisa. The body of Christ broken for you, Kelsey. The body of Christ broken for you, Steve. Jim, this is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Patty. The body of Christ broken for you, Tim. The body of Christ broken for you, Jim. Ross, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you, AJ. Demond, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Love you. Cassandra, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Marissa, the body of Christ broken for you. As Mason comes forward to lead us in prayers for the world, I invite us to join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dear God, we pray for the people of the Baltimore area following the, uh, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which was a vital piece of infrastructure that was hit by a ship and it has affected a lot of people. And we also pray for the people in uh, Botswana and South Africa as a bus carrying uh, dozens of Christian pilgrims who are heading from Botswana to a city in South Africa for Easter. 
uh, rolled off of a bridge and kill, killed almost all of them. And we also pray for uh, doctors who are trying to research why more young people are getting colon cancer. We pray that they would find a find out why that is and if there's a way to treat it or prevent it. And we pray for all those who are currently affected by this. Amen. And we continue together in our prayers for the people. God of our deepest joys and alleluias, we sing our resurrection songs this morning, not only because of the miraculous historical event of your resurrection, but because you continue to bring life out of death and hope out of despair. We pray to you this morning for Pastor Kate, who has long-term COVID symptoms involving her eyes, migraines, and extreme fatigue. We ask, oh God, that you would help Kate and give her your healing. Lord, in your love. Patty asks for prayers for her oldest sister, Linda, and her husband, who are battling illness. Lord, in your love. Sandy Driscoll asks for prayers for her husband, Mike, who's having cataract surgery tomorrow. Lord, in your love. Cindy offers prayers of joy that Austin and Kevin's move to Minnesota has been successful. Lord, in your love. Cindy Madison asks for prayers for Jake and Jenna's dad, who passed away late Wednesday night, and asks for continued prayers of healing for Jake following his surgery three days ago. For this entire family, Lord, in your love. We lift up to you today all those who need your healing and your help, some of whom are, have been named and many of whom we hold in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your love. Oh God, when the stone was rolled away and light entered Christ's tomb, you entrusted each of us to be bearers of light into dark places in our world, carriers of inexhaustible hope into lives filled with despair. May the joy of this morning empower us in our living out of these tasks, and may the triumph of the resurrection empower our acts of service. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn, He Lives. Let's stand and sing with joy.
Just a few brief announcements before we depart today. I'd like to invite you all to join me again.